Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. We are grateful to you for being such amazing listeners. Thank you for your continuous support. While we record new podcast episodes with your favorite GPCR scientists, let's spend some time revisiting previous episodes as we enter the end of 2023 and we start a brand new year. We wish you and your families happy holidays and a wonderful new year. We're currently working on the Dr. GPCR University to provide you courses and content on all aspects of GPCR research to support our community. Our first course will be held live on Zoom starting February 8th, 2024 by none other than Dr. Terry Kinakin. For more details, including the registration information, the specific dates and topics covered, go to the ecosystem at drgpcr.com slash ecosystem. Spots are limited to 20 participants. And if you decide to join us, you'll get a one year complimentary Dr. GPCR ecosystem membership. Become a Dr. GPCR ecosystem member and enjoy rewatching all the Dr. GPCR recorded talks during the summit and the symposium. You'll also get access to the video casts of our podcast, and soon you'll have access to a great collection of Dr. GPCR University courses. You can also member, message members privately, network with your community worldwide. We now have launched a monthly payment option for your premium membership. Renew your Dr. GPCR membership for 2024 with a more comfortable option. Are you looking to hire? Are you looking for a job? We've got you covered. Contact our Dr. GPCR chief matchmaker, Mark Schmeisel, to help you either hire the ideal candidate for your company or help you find your next job. I sp sat down and spoke with Mark directly uh, in episode 55 of the, of the Dr. GPCR podcast. If you'd like to get to know him better, go and re-listen to this podcast episode. You can also reach out to Mark at drgpcr.com slash jobs. And now let's dive into this episode. Hello everyone, this is Yamina from Dr. GPCR. And today I have the pleasure of talking to Dr. Joanne Trejo from UCSD. Hi, Joanne. Hi, Yamina, how are you? I'm great. I'm glad that we finally got a, got a time for us to, to sit down and chat. Um, welcome to the to the podcast. I'm excited to be talking to you, um, as we do with all our guests. Please give us an introduction to who you are happy as a scientist. To. Absolutely, happy, happy to. So, um, first of all, it's really a pleasure to uh, participate in this uh, podcast and to share a little bit of information about myself. You know, um, as a scientist as well as um, our work on GPCRs. So um, I uh, grew up in central um, California, in the Central Valley of California, and I don't come from a family or a long pedigree of scientists. In fact, I'm, I'm the only scientist in my family. Um, and I'm often asked, how did you get interested in science? Um, and my response typically is, I, to me, it was really a sort of a natural inclination um, as a child, I was very curious and um, liked to understand how things worked. And especially if there were things that were broken, I was very interested in figuring out how to fix them. Um, so I think that sort of is something that I was naturally born with, was a, a, a natural curiosity of trying to understand, you know, how things um, how things work. And that sort of is a natural transition into problem solving, which is a big part of science, right? Is that we're trying to understand complex processes, you know, in our particular field relevant to disease um, and trying to understand, break apart those different processes and components so we can figure out where the process has gone awry. Um, and um, that to me is really fascinating. And I'm very excited about um, those, sort of, uh, those sort of processes. Um, my sort of formal introduction uh, to science and what it was really about was um, through one of my high school teachers. Uh, her father was an engineer uh, professor at UC Berkeley, and um, I was very fortunate to have him take an interest in, um, in me because I was interested in science. And I had an opportunity to visit his laboratory at UC Berkeley when I was in high school and um, really fascinating, even though it was mechanical engineering and combustion and 
alternators and how those things um, worked, it was really exciting to me. And so um, that I think also had a pretty big impression on me because I got to learn about science, you know, uh, real, real science as it goes on in a laboratory and to meet somebody who was an outstanding scientist. So I, I call him my first scientist mentor, and that was Dr. Uh, Professor Anthony Oppenheim. He's now um, deceased. I went to college at uh, UC Davis, University of California, Davis, which is in the Central Valley in California. And it was about 40 miles from where I grew up. I grew up in Stockton in San Joaquin County. And it was like I had landed on a different planet, um, living uh, on campus and getting accustomed to the college life was very different from my home environment. Um, I am Mexican-American and grew up in a very traditional uh, uh, Mexican-American family. And so um, the, there was a bit of cultural shock, I'd have to say, uh, for the first year. Um, when I started my undergraduate studies, I had the um, the interest of, of studying engineering because it was really the only thing I was exposed to. And I took um, the high level calculus classes and started taking engineering classes. And, and it was fine. It was very competitive, extremely competitive. You know, I, I did really well as a high school student, but when you go to college, you're competing with people who also did extremely well as high school students. And the competition was pretty fierce. Um, and then I decided to take a, a biochemistry course and I absolutely fell in love with, with the topic. And so um, after well, I guess during my freshman year, I switched majors and uh, focused on biochemistry and toxicology at UC Davis and took biology classes as well. And I really loved chemistry, especially organic chemistry, um, and uh, really got uh, very interested in, in that. Um, I also had the opportunity um, as an undergraduate, now this was in the 1980s, um, uh, when there weren't a lot of opportunities to do summer research um, in laboratories. Uh, however, through my connection with Professor Oppenheim, he introduced me um, to a program at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, which is right above UC Berkeley, up in the Berkeley Hills. And they had a summer program and I was able, I applied to the program. I'm sure with his influence, I was admitted into the program and worked there in the summer, um, every summer since my freshman year uh, through college in a laboratory that was really looking at breast cancer and, um, and, and um, chemicals that influence uh, breast cancer uh, progression. And that was with Jack Bartley and Martha Stamfer, who was, who was there at the laboratory. Um, I, uh, that also meant that I had to live in Berkeley for the summer for these eight to 10 week um, uh, internships. And I was also very fortunate that Dr. Oppenheim had a small little cottage uh, in their, on their, you know, where, where they lived and on their property um, in North Berkeley. And I was invited to live there, which was great because I didn't have to pay rent. So I was able to save some money um, during those uh, that I earned during the summer internship. Um, but I think more importantly is I got to see how a professor actually lived. And I'm like, this is a pretty good life. You know, he yeah. loves what he does. Um, he teaches, he does research. He's a happy person. You know, that's something that I really want to do. And I think that really exposed me to what it, what life is like as an academic. Now, I didn't know very much about the grant writing and all this stuff, but he was constantly working on papers and constantly working on chapters. And I find today, you know, that's a lot of my time is writing papers. You get that one done. We're working on the next paper. Currently, I'm, I'm co-authoring a chapter for Brody's Pharmacology with Laura Bond and Jim Garrison. And that's been quite kind of fun on, um, on uh, GPCRs and molecular pharmacology. Um, so that's sort of, you know, my background as, as a scientist. One, as I was, you know, um, uh, getting ready to graduate, I knew I wanted to go to graduate school. And um, I had a lot of people talking to me about going to medical school, um, mm -hmm. including Dr. Oppenheim, and strongly encouraging me to take that path. But it, it, it wasn't in my heart. It was, I, I didn't want to to be around six people. I, I mean, medicine is fascinating, understanding the disease process, which is what I do 
as a as a scientist, as a biomedical yeah. researcher, but I didn't want to um, to treat patients, and so I decided to apply to graduate programs, and I wanted to study drugs and how drugs worked, and I think that was in part because of my passion and interest in in biochemistry and inorganic chemistry. Um, and so I applied to different graduate programs and decided to come to graduate school actually at UC San Diego. And at that time in the, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, it wasn't an umbrella program like, like mm -hmm. there are today. Many graduate programs are these large programs. Um, it was physiology and pharmacology. And I believe that it was maybe six to eight students admitted um, every year. Wow. And um, we had to take the first two year courses with the medical students, which was quite fun and quite competitive. <laughs> and we got introduced to, you know, organ physiology, essentially. Our, the name of our graduate program was physiology and pharmacology. So you really got good training in physiology, whole animal physiology, as well as human, you know, physiology and pharmacology. Um, and I completed my graduate work with uh, Joan Heller Brown. And um, in her laboratory at that time, we were studying um, uh, the coagulant protease thrombin and how thrombin uh, signaled to um, uh, basically to, to enhance gene transcription. And at that time, there was, you know, a big interest in understanding um, early immediate genes. Uh, so these are like FOS and June uh, transcription yeah. factors and how those factors regulated uh, gene expression. And so uh, my dissertation work was focused on delineating pathways that controlled um, regulation of gene expression by, by um, thrombin essentially. At that time, we didn't know what the thrombin receptor was. Okay. And so thrombin, as, as we know, is a very important um, enzyme. It's the key effector protease of the coagulation cascade. Um, it's essential for, for life. If you knock it out, you yep. don't get, you don't develop very well. You, uh, um, you know, it's uh, detrimental very early in, in the developmental stages. Um, and um, it's, you know, uh, obviously very important for blood clotting and so on and so forth. And, and important for, you know, drug therapy, warfarin and other things that target yep. coagulation factors um, to reduce um, um, thrombin generation. Um, so, uh, so, but we didn't know what the receptor was um, and it was not clear what kind of receptor it was. It's a protease and yet this protease can produce very interesting results, uh, you know, in cells. Um, and I, during the latter part of my graduate studies, uh, Sean Coughlin identified and discovered the thrombin receptor, which is PAR1, protease activated receptor one, um, through really elegant studies um, using xenopus oocytes and sib selection, doing mRNA expression, and you know, really showed that it was a phenomenal mechanism, unusual, atypical mechanism of activation where the protease actually cleaves the receptor to unveil a tethered ligand, which is already present in the receptor amino terminal domain, but it's masked. And the protease essentially cleaves that amino terminus exposing the tethered ligand domain, which then interacts somehow with the receptor um, and you know, induces a conformational change that then allows the receptor to couple the heterotrimeric G proteins at the plasma membrane. So after completing my studies um, with uh, Joan Heller Brown, I, I looked at um, uh, a couple of different labs. So some labs that were focused on gene transcription. So Keith Yamamoto's lab at UCSF. Um, I also looked at Inder Verma's lab at the Salk Institute and then Sean Coughlin's lab. And it was a little bit, you know, um, hesitant about Sean's lab because he was so young, you know, he had just mm -hmm. discovered uh, this receptor. And, um, but I decided that's where I, that's where I was going to go. And so I joined his lab in 1992 as a postdoctoral fellow at UCSF and, um, had an amazing time. Um, it really exposed me to, um, you know, uh, phenomenal science, um, colleagues who were, um, you know, just as passionate about science and colleagues who came from different backgrounds too. So, uh, Sean was trained as a cardiologist, so we had a lot of cardiology fellows. 
uh, in the lab. Um, he was also involved in the physician scientist training program. So we had MD, PhDs, PhDs, and primarily a, a postdoc driven uh, laboratory. And um, the focus of my project in his lab was really trying to understand how signaling by this receptor, which is essentially proteolytically irreversibly activated, how is signaling controlled? And, and we knew it gave graded responses. You can get a dose response. So clearly signaling was being, you know, shut off. Um, and, um, but it, you know, it has this tethered ligand, which is essentially, you know, present on the receptor all the time, unlike, um, other GPCRs where it can, you know, uh, it's freely diffusible. So that was really a big focus of, of my work um, in his laboratory. And that um, introduced me to cell biology because the trafficking of the receptor is very important for controlling its signaling responses. Um, and you have, you know, the initial desensitization, which we see with all GPCRs. However, um, the sorting of that receptor into endosomes and then lysosomes is absolutely essential for terminating signaling. And if you allow the receptor to go back to the plasma membrane, you get this persistent signaling. Um, and that's you know, detrimental to any normal physiological response. And um, what we've discovered la later in my laboratory is actually an invasive breast cancer. PAR1 is highly overexpressed and it, it has these attributes of persistent signaling and it's signals like that because it fails to sort to lysosomes for degradation. Um, and um, at UCSF, you know, having that interest in cell biology also allowed me to interact with, you know, some really phenomenal cell biologists, Reg Kelly, uh, Francis Brodsky. Um, we interacted with the young Mark Van Zostro at that time and he was just starting <laughs> his lab um, and really, uh, uh, gave me, you know, really good uh, background and knowledge in, in cell biology. And, you know, I think when I reflect on that, you know, I realize that science is so multidisciplinary, you know, I, I was trained really in a kind of in a cell signaling molecular pharmacology lab, you know, went to Sean's lab and, and really got exposed to cell biology and developed uh, expertise in cell biology and in membrane trafficking uh, lysosomal sorting, which is very phenomenal. And it's something that I've continued in my own um, own laboratory. Um, and I think, you know, as GPCRologists, we have to go where the science takes us. And so, you know, we're constantly um, interfacing with different fields. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, that's actually a, 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 a benefit and a, and a great thing about working with GPCRs. That's fantastic. And uh, I, I was just, you know, I, I think you had a, a magical trajectory. Just the fact that you were exposed as a teenager to what a scientist does and what's life as an academic look like. Um, it, it's just, I think it seems that to me that it did really shape your trajectory, that you very early on recognized you saw yourself doing that same type of work. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, before you mentioned Professor Oppenheim and the fact that he was an engineer and you were mentioning that you really like to just to understand how events happen, how things happen. I was going to say, why, why biology and why not engineering? And then <laughs> you said it. And I figured, OK, so here's my question. Let's, let's go back to the beginning uh, where. So the biology part came in, in undergraduate school when you took that biochemistry class. Were you ever interested in biology before that? Um, not really. And I think in part because I wasn't really exposed to it. You know, in high school, we took chemistry, we took physics and um, maybe and I can't even remember but maybe my biology teacher was really bad. I don't remember anything about biology from high school. I went to a Catholic high school to St. Mary's high school. And so, um, you know, it was, I mean, you know, we were taught mostly by nuns and priests mm -hmm. and, um, but I don't remember biology. My first exposure to biology really was in college. But so, yeah, it, I think, I think at that young age as a teenager, um, having a good teacher is what makes an impact and sometimes determines someone's path forward when it comes to their absolutely career absolutely um so you know i given that you know i i didn't come i didn't grow up in a household that where 
education was emphasized. You know, we, we didn't have books. We didn't have, you know, a lot of those things. And, I, you know, I am here today because of the mentors that I have had, the, the phenomenal mentors that I have had. And I've been very fortunate to cross paths with, you know, uh, people who really saw promise in me and saw um, some talent in me and really encouraged me to pursue this career in science. Um, so mentors are really, really um, important and they're out there. And, um, you know, I think young people should realize that there's, you know, you can have 10 different mentors that mentors serve different yeah. purposes. And, um, you know, some mentors are more nurturing. Some people, some people mentor by example, but that's a mentor because they really show you what rigorous science can be like. I love that you, you touched on a very important point. And I think the word mentor sometimes scares students and people off saying, well, how do I find a mentor and who's a mentor? Mm -hmm. And um, oftentimes, you know, the best way to go about it is really to talk to people and to see who you can look up to. And as you mentioned, someone who, who teaches by example or who someone recognizes something in you and decides to, to help you out. Right. But um, how do you, how, and, it seems to me that mentorship is very important to you. How do you pay that forward? What you received <laughs> from others? Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's a big focus on on mentorship. It, it mentorship is absolutely critical for success in in any career, and particularly in academic medicine and science. Um, and um, we, you know, one of the things we certainly recognize in, in academia and science is that uh, mentorship is not even. Um, and that is that, you know, often, um, you know, women and underrepresented uh, scientists don't have access to, to good, high quality mentoring. Um, so one of the things that I do just personally is um, to try to ensure that, that I'm, um, an effective mentor and, and mentoring is, it's, it's not something that you're just born to do. It's a learned skill. Um, I think um, Bob Lef Lefkowitz is really a phenomenal mentor. And, and one of the reasons why he's a phenomenal mentor and he's somebody that I ad admire and aspire to be like, is that he knows how to motivate people. Um, and, you know, we often, we talk about our successes um, and in any laboratory, there's also, you know, uh, individuals that, that aren't successful. That's just the nature of, of having a lab and working with people. Um, one of the reasons why learning to be a good mentor is important is that when you have more than one person in the room, there's two people, there, there will be conflict. It's just a natural inherent thing of any relationship. There will be misunderstandings. There will be conflict of, of different sorts. And there's a, um, a, a good way to handle conflict and there's a bad way to handle conflict. And you have to learn how to handle conflict well um, to ensure that everyone's sort of, you know, ultimate goals are, are being met. And, you know, as professors, in, in particularly in academia, you know, our job is to train, is, is not only to do really good science, um, to, to, you know, have a well-funded research program that's doing innovative cutting in science, but we're also training postdocs and students. And that's a constant um, element of, of our programs. And, um, it, you know, so you're constantly getting new people that have um, that that respond differently to mentorship than other people. So you you have to be also very flexible. It's not one size fits all mentoring. Um, you know, it's almost tailored and customized mentoring for each person. Um, a big part of developing good mentoring relationships is getting to know people and developing trust in those relationships and to and to know that your mentor has your best interest in in mind, you know, that they really, you know, um, uh, understand, you know, all of the different um, demands on your time and work with you to, to try to facilitate your success in, in the laboratory. And I, I feel that has gone, that, that works much better than the old fashioned way of, you know, just demanding that you do this, this, and this. Um, you touched on, on a couple of very in, important points. Um, I think, 
when when you're a mentor, when you're a head of lab, when you're a manager, which I don't like the word manager, but let's let's just use it for for the sake of example. You have a responsibility towards your people. Mm-hmm. You basically hold their careers in your in your hands, right. and it's it's like being a parent. Uh, you know, making sure that all the different kids uh, have w- whatever they need for for their own development to develop their own um, confidence, mm-hmm. but also they're different. And I think that's that's something that may not be um, a concept that everyone understands, which is why I think it's important to point out that it is important to make sure that all the students or the postdocs get get that opportunity. Right. to build their confidence, to do great research and having that mentor, having that person saying, well, this may not be the best idea, but go ahead and try it. Let's see what happens is very important. Then again, as you mentioned, trust is also very important mm-hmm. because if you don't trust each other, then any comment that is slightly negative, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's going to be taken personally. And it's not for science is, is not personal when it comes to the data. Mm-hmm. The data is the data. Right. Right. I love that. I love that. So let's let's yeah. move a little bit uh, further into, so you mentioned uh, PAR, uh, the PAR receptor and all your work during your postdoc on it. When was the moment when it was discovered that it was a GPCR? <laughs> um, it was basically when they cloned it, you know, when they cloned um, and they looked at the sequence and, and compared it to known GPCRs at, at the time, which are the beta receptors. It's a seven spin <laughs> domain receptor. Um, and uh, I think that was a big, you know, that was like an aha uh, moment. It was like, wow. And then the challenge was, well, how does it work? And it, and it turns out that the PAR1 receptor has a sequence in the amino terminus that's called the heridin-like domain, which is um, uh, um, a uh, basically heridin is, is a small peptide that's released by leech, and mm-hmm. it binds to thrombin and inhibits thrombin's activity. So it was very clear that okay, so thrombin likely interacts with this heridin-like domain or sequence. And it's a protease and it's a serine protease. And there were, you know, your classic, you know, cleavage sites and, and serine protease cleavage sites. And, you know, they just basically tested the hypothesis. If we mutate that to, you know, an arginine or a different residue, would you block cleavage? And then, you know, they got, I think they moved pretty quickly after that. So the, the receptor was cloned before I actually arrived in the lab. It was 1991 and I arrived mm-hmm. in the lab in 1992. Okay, because my next question would have been, how did, you know, knowing that that PAR1 is a GPCR affect your way of, of looking at the receptor and how did that affect your work? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I was really interested in, um, in primarily in understanding signal regulatory um, mechanisms. Um, I think one of the things that um, I, I also love about this um, class of receptors is we very early on discovered that yes, signaling is regulated by desensitization, but beyond that, signal regulation tends to be, you know, we call atypical. Um, it does not require beta restants for endocytosis, for example. They're completely dispensable. That was the first paper I published as an assistant professor. So I took my first faculty position at UNC Chapel Hill, and one of the questions I wanted to address is, okay, so we know this receptor is desensitized by GRKs, beta arrestins, you know, are are required for this. Um, Isn't it also important for um, for internalization, like the classic GPCRs? Um, And so um, I, that was a time where uh, Bob Lefkowitz had just knocked out um, both beta restin one and beta restin two in, in mice. And they had derived these um, mouse embryonic fibroblasts. And I said, those are the perfect, this is long before CRISPR technology. So this is old school technology. We had the gene knockout, but it was, and, and also before siRNA was used routinely yep. in the lab. Um, and so we had the, you know, the genetic knockouts. Um, and I said, this would be the perfect system for me to test this, you know, hypothesis. So it took me about half a day to compose an email to him because I had to be perfect. I wanted to make sure I got my point across. At first I had to introduce myself to him. And it turns out in the Lefkowitz um, pedigree, I'm like the great, great granddaughter or something like that, (laughs) because Sean Coughlin 
trained with Rusty Williams, who I think was Bob's first graduate student. Um, wow. graduate student. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I compose this email, I send it to him and he literally responds within two minutes asking yep. for these cells. Right. And he said, Oh, absolutely. Why don't you come on over and let's talk about this and so on like that. And I said, great. When are you available? I'm available tomorrow. Why don't you come tomorrow? <laughs> and it was just like, Oh my God, like my whole world blew up. And so we got the, you know, all the cells, the control cells and so on and so forth. We put in our, our receptor and lo and behold, you know, endocytosis was just fine. And so um, that led to, you know, us identifying new pathways that um, GPCRs utilize for um, endocytosis. It, it requires the adaptive protein complex two and Epson, and also um, led us to the discovery of a, of a novel pathway for sorting um, GPCRs from endosome to lysosomes that bypass this requirement uh, for ubiquitin. And it's just opened up, you know, huge um, new discoveries. And, you know, always in the back of my mind, you know, we always show it for, you know, other GPCRs that are expressed in a similar context. So the two systems that we focus on in the lab are endothelial cells, because that's where protease activated receptors have important functions. And then we can translate our work to vascular inflammation, which is really important. And we're looking at them in a, in a natural context and, you know, endogenous receptors. And then in breast cancer, where this receptor is highly overexpressed and contributes to breast cancer progression. Um, so um, one of the other things, you know, we discovered um, is that multiple GPCRs in those cells. So pure energic receptor, P2Y1, yep. histamine receptor, uh, the prostaglandin receptors are also regulated similarly. And so my question is, is, you know, these pathways that we discover, are they really atypical or are they just another pathway? And, you know, cause I mean, clearly the beta receptor is the prototype, but regulation of the beta two receptor is not completely applicable to all GPCRs. And there's so many GPCRs that we haven't even looked at yet. Agreed. And I, lo I love that. Every, any, any, anytime someone says, well, you know, we, we went with the beta adrenergic receptor, I say, well, that's, that's great and nice. And yes, there is still work to be done on the beta adrenergic. There are things that we don't know, but uh, it is not the only pathway. The, it is not the only way of, mm -hmm. of doing these things. Right. So I ask this from everyone and I kind of know the answer. I think anyone listening to this podcast, when, when it will be released, will know the answer to this. Is PAR1 your favorite GPCR? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> um, did you ever envision working on another system? So um, we uh, so we, we do look at other PARs. Um, so we've done work with PAR2 mm -hmm. um, and also PAR4, um, PAR3 um, a little bit. Um, in one project that we're working on now is um, it's related to uh, biased uh, signaling by PAR. So protease activated receptors, like all GPCRs likely, uh, display biased agonism. So depending mm -hmm. on the activating protease, um, you get a different um, you get a different generation of a distinct peptide ligand, which not surprisingly interacts with the receptor differently and gives you a different flavor of signaling. Um, so we're looking at this in the context of um, endothelial dysfunction. So thrombin, you know, clearly during vascular injury or inflammation, thrombin's generated, it cleaves PAR1, it promotes a, a whole host of inflammatory responses that generally result in disruption of the endothelial barrier. So you get tissue edema, vascular leakage, and, and so on and so forth, similar to histamine. There's another protease in the coagulation system that actually um, is a, um, works to, to reduce thrombin generation. But this, this protease is called the activated protein C. Mm -hmm. um, it actually signals to cells via cleavage of PAR1 at a distinct site. And it gives a complete opposite effect compared to thrombin. So it stabilizes barriers, it promotes anti-inflammatory responses and anti-apoptotic responses. Um, and it does this 
through um, interaction with other GPCRs. So I think other GPCRs, for example, the sphingosine one phosphate receptor and PAR3 expressed in endothelial cells are influencing the signaling by PAR1 in this context. And it turns out that the signaling is compart compartmentalized in caviola on endothelial cells. So endothelial cells have a lot of cavioli and they, they you know, sequester receptors and signaling molecules to uh, promote kind of more signaling specificity and, and efficiency. Um, and so that has something to do with it as well as the compartmentalization of these receptors in these uh, micro domains in endothelial cells. Um, but those other receptors are, are quite interesting and so it's really looking at PAR1 and how PAR1 signaling is being influenced by these, we call them co-receptors. I love it. And I, I love the way the way you explain these things. I could see, you know, a whole universe happening, you know, <laughs> in the epithelial cells where, where PAR1 is the, uh, you know, the, the, the star actor, but then you have all these supporting roles that are being filled out by, by other GPCRs. To, to kind of, you know, have that, that, uh, that balance, that yin and yang, you know, mm -hmm. inflammation versus reducing inflammation, which I think is, is just fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a project right now that we're very excited about. We have a um, couple of manuscripts coming out pretty soon on, on that topic. So ah, we look forward to those. Uh, we're really excited about that. Um, you mentioned that you're looking also at PAR1 in the context of cancer as well. What are some of the projects that you're you're working on currently? Yeah, so again, this is a, a really interesting and nice example of how PAR1 has unveiled new biology. So, so you know, we we you know since the work we did with you know Bob Lefkowitz, and I believe that paper was published in 2002 or 2004, and Bob is a co-author. My first paper is an assistant professor um, in JBC. Um, so, you know, we realized that this receptor has different trafficking um, patterns. And then we discovered in these invasive breast cancers that the receptors overexpressed. So then we started, uh, you know, working on trying to delineate, well, how is the receptor trafficked in those cells and so on and so forth. Um, and one of the, the you know, um, links that we got um, based on um, uh some work on trying to look at pathways that were non-classical lysosomal sorting pathways was this protein called Alex. Um, so that was the first kind of discovery is that, you know, receptors sort uh, through these pathways and we kind of just, you know, define that pathway. Um, and then um, some other work showed um, that there's a new, there's an additional family of arrestants called alpha arrestants. Okay, so these are, um, they're highly prevalent in yeast. So yeast don't have beta arrestins. Um, they have another type of molecule called alpha arrestins that are predicted to have similar structure uh, based on, on, on predictive biology. So they have that, you know, your classical beta arrestin N domain, uh, C domain, and the C tails are actually quite uh, divergent. Um, but there is no evidence that these, proteins regulate GPCRs in yeast. They mostly regulate transporters and other uh, types of proteins. Then they discovered that there's mammalian homologs of these proteins. Again, sharing you know, similar uh, structural features um, with beta restins. Make a long story short, we kind of honed in on one of these members called ARRDC3. So this is an alpha restin and it is a tumor suppressor. Um, so in, especially in invasive breast cancer, it's expression, it's either there's a chromosomal deletion or it's, it's silenced through epigenetic regulation, acetylation or methylation of the promoter regions. Um, and so when we started looking in our invasive breast cancer cells, you know, we thought, well, maybe there's a, a defect in Alex. So this is this alternative lysosomal yep. sorting pathway. Alex expression was fine. You know, we sequenced that. We sequenced the receptor from these, you know, um, cell lines to make sure there were no mutations in PAR1, no mutations in Alex. And, you know, then we started looking at this ARDC3 and it's like, well, it's absent in invasive breast cancer because it's a tumor suppressor. And so tumor suppressors are, are being, you know, we don't want this. 
So we developed, you know, inducible ways of, of re-expressing this protein. And when we re-expressed the wild type protein, we were able to restore normal trafficking of PAR1 in these cells. And that was really, really, it was such a clean system because there was a natural knockout. And then we just did the reconstitution or the re-expression and were able to restore trafficking of the receptor. Um, so one of the big areas that we're focusing on is how alpha arrestin um, basically uh, elicits its tumor suppressor functions. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, what pathways is it impinging on? Um, so we've just, just, we just published a paper in Journal of Cell Science that shows that it regulates the hippo yap pathway. Um, so, um, you know, it certainly is interacting there. And we have some other work that's in, um, uh, that's in progress where we're looking at other uh, pathways. And, you know, we're um, essentially also looking at how this molecule um, can exhibit diverse functions, like what are the critical determinants of um, regulating its activity and its function um, in breast cancer. And again, it's, you know, like beta arrestins, I mean, certainly they're, they're regulating GPCRs, but they also regulate other cargo. I mean, beta arrestins can regulate integrins. So this receptor um, regulates integrins, transporters, you know, yeah. other, other cargos. Um, and likely the activation of the, of the arrestins are, are different. For GPCRs, it's more of a, you know, we can trigger um, arrestin activation through different um, uh, mechanisms. Um, so that's that's a big area that we're that we're focusing on in the lab right now. That's that's great. Um, I have absolutely zero background when it comes to whatever happened. How do you measure degradation and how do you measure trafficking of of receptors? I mean, I have an idea, but I have never had you know concrete a uh, lab experience. So I'd like to take a moment and talk a little bit about the tools, the experimental tools mm -hmm. that you use in the lab to study the, these events. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So good, good question. Um, so, you know, well, I think we were, we were a fortunate with PAR1 because PAR1 is activated through proteolytic cleavage. So there's determinants in the end terminus that allowed us and facilitated the development of really good antibodies. Okay. So, you know, the, a big problem with GPCRs is there's terrible antibodies. And so you have to yeah. tag them um, either with an epitope tag or, you know, a massive GFP or YFP, which I don't like. I mean, <laughs> those things are, you know, uh, they're beast. Um, and so um, in Sean's lab, Sean had developed some antibodies. And then as an assistant professor at UNC Chapel Hill, I developed some um, polyclonal antibodies. And then um, we recently also got hybridomas to those original um, weedy antibodies against PAR1 and spent quite a bit of money to develop our own hybridomas. And so, that. so we've got yep. good tools to follow uh, the receptor. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we're using are um, uh, to study the receptor in its natural context. So we have got good antibodies so we can follow the receptor. You know, that's not a problem. We can IP the receptor. We can, you know, isolate the receptor yep. is um, doing a proteomic analysis on trying to identify, um, you know, uh, different pathway components. So we actually had a nice paper in PNAS published in 2020, where we looked at the phosphor proteome of uh, thrombin activated PAR1 versus the biased agonist APC activated PAR1. And you can just see these two pathways completely diverge. And that was a nice um, study for me. It was the first proteomic analysis I had done because you know the expectation is, well, you, if you stimulate cells, everything's gonna be phosphorylated. No, you get you know all these different changes in phosphorylation, not just temporally, but you see increases in phosphorylation and decreases in phosphorylation. And it's different at different times. Um, and that allowed us to identify some interesting um, modulators of endothelial barrier uh, function. Um, so, you know, some of the tools that we're using and developing um, in the laboratory are uh, trying to um, use uh, proteomics, phosphor proteomics routinely in our analysis. We're very fortunate being at UCSD and having colleagues, you know, who can do this on a whim. Um, and, and, and one of the, 
you know, certainly an aspect of science, and I, I believe most everyone would say this is, you know, it's it's hard to do good science as a single PI. Everything is very collaborative. A lot of team science, um, and you know, in the Department of Pharmacology at UCSD, we have a strong group of investigators, and they're all highly collaborative. So we work very closely with David Gonzalez. He's our mass spec experts. Um, and a lot of that work is really initiated by the students and the postdocs because they're the ones doing the work. And, you know, it's through their relationships that, that we get a lot of this work done. And then with uh, Jen Zong, um, who does the uh, FRET biosensors, uh, she's an amazing collaborator, collaborator um, and has, you know, we, we have to, you know, get these biosensors into endothelial cells and other cell systems, but, um, you know, she's really, um, very collaborative in helping us conduct some of those studies as well. Um, so tools, you know, uh, Brett biosensors are really valuable tools because now you can target them to different, um, uh, locations in the cell. So, you know, we're also interested in endosomal signaling so we can target certain biosensors to endosomes, you can target them to lysosomes, you can target them to the plasma membrane. Um, so that's a, a tool set that's, um, that's also important. And who would have thought that, you know, no, quote unquote, non-specific breath signal could be such a great tool. The, the term um, for those biosensors that are at the endosome, the RAB5 and, yeah. and such, the, the term escapes me, but uh, um, uh, it was bystander Brett. That's what I was looking yeah. for. Yes, bystander Brett. Yeah, yeah. Which which yeah. is phenomenal. Um, yeah. And so we've talked a little bit about the tools that you do have to study uh, PAR one. Uh, if you had, you know, a magic wand and you could, you know, make appear new tools that would allow you to uh, get more data faster and and um, you know advance your projects, how would those tools look like? Or what yeah. would those two look like? Yeah. So one of the things that, you know, we would, um, in addition, so we've got really good biosensors for, for signaling. Um, you know, we're interested in endothelial barrier regulation, both how it's strengthened and then how it's um, disrupted. And it's really localized signaling um, that is, that is going on. So, you know, thrombin, histamine, they will cause changes in barrier, but it's very transient. It's very dynamic. You know, it, it, it becomes um, uh, disrupted and then you get recovery. And some of the molecules that we're looking at affect different aspects of that barrier disruption. Some of them will enhance initiation or the magnitude of the barrier disruption and others are affecting the recovery. Actually, in fact, we have a paper um, that is in cell science signaling that'll be published uh, August 31st, um, where we identified um, heat shot protein 27 as being um, a mediator for recovery. And we know very little about the mechanisms. Um, it's, it's not something that just happens naturally. It's controlled um, by signals to get the barrier uh, to recover. Um, and what's been challenging for us is to be able to look in a very localized um, area of the cell and to see, you know, what's going on with changes in actin cytoskeleton and or adhesion um, junction molecules and, and molecules that are important for, for controlling barrier uh, regulation. So that, that is, you know, and that's going to require sophisticated imaging and FRET analysis and lots of tool building, most likely. Uh, to get at some of those uh, those questions. I love that. And I love also, well, uh, just the way you're explaining it, it seems to me that, you know, you'll, you'll need new tools, new biosensors to really look at um, live events that happen yeah. over a period of time and perhaps being able to distinguish between different molecules that control the signal, but also the length of the signal and the types of the, uh, of the changes, the type of changes that happen yeah. in the system. Yeah. Um, this is, uh, this is really, really interesting. Um, we're going to move on to my next question, which I ask to, to, to everyone. And the answer is always yes, but I always ask guests to elaborate a little bit after that. Yes. Do you think GPCRs are still good drug targets? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. In fact, they're probably better drug targets than they, than, than we thought they would be, you know, 
uh, 20 years ago. And that's because of the biased um, properties of the receptors. The fact that you could, you know, fine tune or, you know, activate the receptor to prefer certain pathways and not others. And in fact, for PAR1, this activated protein C, which promotes barrier uh, protection, um, it actually was on the market as a drug to treat sepsis, um, and its name was Zygris. Uh, Eli Lilly um, had it on the market. Um, and this is really important because we have very few drugs that um, can strengthen the barrier. So, you know, often what happens in, in quite um, severe inflammatory conditions, uh, such as sepsis, where you have systemic um, inflammation, is the, you know, the ultimate pathological event that essentially leads to, you know, admittance into ICU units and, and often, you know, mortality is this breakdown of the barrier. So you get this tissue edema, you get vascular leakage and tissue edema. Um, and they, they treat patients with diuretics to try and reduce, you know, the edema in the tissues and so on and so forth. And that will result in, in organ failure. Um, and so, you know, at least in, in our opinion, um, you know, we feel like GPCRs, they're highly druggable. Um, we now know that they can, they can, you know, signal biasly for PAR1, we know that if you activate it in this certain way, that's how APC activates it, you can strengthen the barrier. And so it's, it really is, um, you know, an important drug target uh, for that area. Now we're interested in, in identifying the signals um, that mediate this barrier strengthening, right? Because, you know, you know, for certain targets like PAR1, it's also expressed in platelets. And so if you, you know, if you, if you tweak PAR1 in the endothelium, you're also going to hit the platelet uh, receptor. So, you know, the hypothesis is, can we identify a key downstream effector that doesn't have such important broad functions, you know, in, in the human body as a, as a potential target. And that's sort of, you know, our rationale for uh, doing our work and trying to delineate signaling pathways. I think, yes, one of the, uh, one of the challenges is the answer to, to my question is yes, but I think one of the biggest challenges is really uh, to make sure that no matter what kind of drug you, you, you create, it is very specific at that specific tissue in that context of that disease. And oftentimes the problem is, let's say you want to hit a receptor in the brain, but nowhere else in the body. And that's, that's the problem is really, as you mentioned in the beginning, when, when you said that you really like to understand how things work, especially when things are broken and how to put them back together. And like that component, when it comes to translating it into GPCR research is really important to have specific drugs with less side effects, but also that, um, you know, specifically hit the receptor at the right time in the right context at the right, right. place as well. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, let's go back to that first paper that, yeah, that you published. And I love the fact that, you know, Bob responded in, in two seconds to your email. <laughs> <laughs> it is still the case whenever you email yeah. Bob, typically you get a, a response in about two minutes which yeah. I find just, just, just phenomenal. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, that, that first paper and that first work was one of, one of the aha moments that you had as a scientist, mm -hmm. when you discovered that beta resin one and beta resin two had nothing to do with the trafficking of, of par one. What are their def career defining moments or scientific defining moments did you have uh, during your career? Yeah. So I would, so I think that was one of the, one of the first ones. And then the second one is when we made the link between this alpha resin protein and Alex and its impact on, um, on trafficking of the receptor. So that, I think that was uh, around 2005 and a little bit later, um, you know, we made that discovery. And then I guess the third one would be more recently, a uh, work done uh, by a phenomenal postdoc in my lab, Neil Grimsey, who's now an assistant professor at University of Georgia, where, um, again, this evolved from our work that showed that this receptor utilizes this you know, alternative pathway. It's not your classic 
ubiquitin um, escort dependent pathway that sorts most GPCRs into the um, into the lysosome, such as the beta receptor. It gets ubiquitinated, you know, it engages with these escort components, and then it gets shuttled through the sequential pathway into lysosome cell degradation. Um, so, but the conundrum was that when we looked at ubiquitination of our receptor, it was robustly ubiquitinated, and it's like, why would Mother Nature evolve? this process if it's not utilized for something. So that led us along this, this path of trying to understand, well, what's the function of PAR1 ubiquitination? And obviously it's a signaling receptor. So we started you know, screening for different signaling pathways. And what Neil discovered was that the ubiquitination actually acts as a signal to recruit these adapter proteins called TAB. There's TAB1, TAB2. And they directly interact with P38 alpha and can induce P38 activation through an autophosphorylation activation mechanism. Um, and so that was, you know, really um, exciting. He published that in, we published that in Cell Reports in 2018, I believe. Um, and it's, um, you know, a, a, and again, we show that the P2Y1 receptor functions similarly. And again, this is all in the context of endothelial cell uh, signaling. Um, and um, eight, eight, uh, also P2Y1 receptor, uh, prostaglandin receptor as well, they use these uh, uh, proteins to, to activate TAB um, and P38 inflammatory signaling. Um, so that I think those would be the three defining moments of my career. So the first paper, you know, showing that arrestins weren't important, that was work done by a graduate student, May Pang. Uh, then the um, the delineation of an of a alternate you know, ubiquitin independent lysosomal sorting pathway that requires this protein Alex and ARDC3 was work done by another postdoc, Mike Doris, who's an assistant professor at Hofstra University. And then the third um, would be the work that, uh, that Dr. Grimsey did in looking, identifying ubiquitin as a trigger for um, P38 inflammatory signaling. So Fantastic. Um, Talk yeah. about following science <laughs> wherever, yes. the, <laughs> wherever yeah. it needs it, it goes. Yeah. Um, so, we've t- yeah, please, yeah. So, so, you know, I think that to me also is, is an example of, you know, you, this receptor has revealed so much about GPCR regulation that is counter to our prevailing knowledge. I mean, if you talk to a lot of people, there's like, Oh, GPCR is internalized through beta arrestins. They get, you know, they use ubiquitin to sort to to yep. lysosomes. Um, you know, so it's yeah, yeah. It's your, it's yeah. It, and I, I also love the fact that you know you you followed this receptor to discover alternative mechanisms of of trafficking mm-hmm. that also apply to a whole other set of receptors. Right. Right. Which, uh, to your point that you had mentioned in the beginning, it does raise the question: What is the canonical quote unquote canonical uh, receptor trafficking mechanism right. that GPCR is used. I think I think every time I talk to, to someone on, on the podcast or you know in, even in the, in the context of the virtual cafes, I learn something new and I think it just opens up a set of other questions mm-hmm. that we can continue working on forever and ever. Which leads me to to my next question. Um, if you had advice to junior scientists being, you know, PhD students, postdocs, but even in junior faculty mm-hmm. on how to contribute to the field, what would that be? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, they're all likely, you know, working in laboratories that are focusing on GPCRs is to follow your passion. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's difficult sometimes um, because you think everything's been done. And the bottom line is that, you know, look at for PAR1, for example, I mean, you know, nothing, I mean, there's so much more to learn about these receptors. And, and then I think sometimes um, young investigators worry about, okay, well, if I open my lab, I'm, you know, I'm going to be competing with my postdoc mentor and other people, you know, the bottom line is just the nature of science will take you in different directions. And it, it just is, it's like people think differently Um, So the way they design the experiments, um, the way they think about the science is different. And that diverse thought and diverse 
systems and way of, of approaching the same problem is really important because it allows us to discover things that we would we may not have discovered before, and it, it takes you in it. So the, this is natural sort of you know evolution, and I think young people do worry about that. It's like, what am I going to do that's going to be different? Um, I think young people, young investigators, also um, technology is awesome and technology is important, but don't let the technology drive your science. It you, you should not be developing hypotheses and questions that use that are really focused on using the technology to, to you know answer the question you should really you know think of a hypothesis and a question and try to identify a niche area this is one thing also is to try and identify you know an area you know like you don't want to study the beta receptor and beta restin regulation okay because there's like you know 5,000 papers on that. You want to try and find a niche area. There are 800 GPCRs. Um, there's a lot out there <laughs> to study um, and you know to follow your passion, to be rigorous, to do rigorous research. Um, you know, my philosophy has always been to try to look at systems where we're studying endogenous receptors and we can translate the work to important, um, physiological responses in vivo. So we do vascular leakage in vivo, or we do tumor metastasis um, using, um, you know, mouse uh, xenograph models and so on and so forth. And if you are able to recapitulate those findings, then you can dive in and, and get at the mechanism. Um, and so that's really important um, as well. Um, so I love that. Uh, and it, it is really important advice. And we talked about this uh, a little bit earlier if I can add to this, uh, collaborations are important. Right. You mentioned how many collaborators you have and how many people contribute. And I think we're fortunate to be in a field where I want to say most of the time it is easy to reach out to people and say, hey, this is this is what I'm thinking. Do you want to grab a coffee virtually for now? But uh, can we put our heads together and collaborate? Right, right. And oftentimes it leads to amazing relationships and that's that's also key to success. Yeah, yeah. No, right. that's that's a really important aspect. Is that also science is done collaboratively and and learning how to network. Sometimes it's not comfortable for you know women and underrepresented scientists to approach people. Um, but it's you know and and it depends on you know how you grew up and your culture and so on and so forth. Um, but there are people out there who are willing to collaborate with you. And, 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 you know, collaborations also, it's, it's like the mentoring, their relationships and not all collaborations um, are ideal, but what you want to do is try to develop good collaborations with colleagues that are trustable. And it may take yeah. you a few attempts uh, to find those people, but be persistent. And, and it's an important skill. It's, and, you know, it's unrealistic to think that, you know, everyone you contact is going to want to collaborate and collaborations also are a two way street. It's collaboration. And so you have to give, but you also should be receiving. And so it's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a two way relationship. I love that. And I think you make, you make a great point when it comes to the fact that it's, it's a two way relationship and also to the fact that sometimes, you know, I feel like, when 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 you're trying to look for a collaborator, when you're trying to look for a mentor, or yeah. when even you're just you take it out of the context of science and you're just looking quote unquote for a job, it's it's similar to to dating. You want to make sure that you're comfortable <laughs> with that person because if you're not and if you don't have that 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 comfort, you don't see eye to eye and you cannot build that trust because ultimately. Once you get to know that person, that other scientist, mm -hmm. you're going to work together and the, the end result will not only be, you know, advancing, answering a scientific question and writing a paper and getting grants together, but also forming that trust. You'll yeah. get to a point where you'll just, you know, scramble an email to that person, not even, you know, thinking about the format and they'll know what you meant. And then they'll be like, okay, I got you. And, and that's, that's an important key. And you just have to be consistent and persistent at finding and surrounding yourself with those people. Yeah. 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 All right. And yeah. on this note, uh, okay. speaking of collaborating and, and having, uh, you know, finding the right mentor, 
when you have job openings uh, in your in your lab, where can people find you? Yeah, so we have a website. Um, you know, the, the easiest way is is if you want to contact me, is just contact me by email. I I I am very responsible and very responsive to emails. Um, typically, when I have an opening, um, you know, um, I will post things on social media, but. If it's a real, you know, if you're a, if you're interested in GPCRs and have an interest in learning about PARs and training in my lab, my lab is is very diverse. You know, we have uh, graduate students; they're phenomenal, as well as postdocs and techs. Um, is just email me directly. So even if I don't, sometimes I have post positions, but sometimes I don't. But you know, I still have positions open, and you know, we are also very successful in getting trainees their own fellowships. My fellows get, you know, American Heart, pre-doctoral fellowships, um, NIH F31s or F32s. And UCSD also has a very large number of training grants. So I think we have something like 44 training grants um, across the institution. And I think 35 of them are in health sciences. That's what the School of Medicine is, Department of Pharmacology is. Um, and so we, you know, we have a lot of resources for training uh, individuals. Um, and you know, as I mentioned, you know, one of our one of our missions is to train. So we train students and postdocs um, all the time. So I, I'm very open to um, entertaining more postdocs and having more postdocs. Um, I've had several transition out um, during the pandemic, um, mm-hmm. which is great. You know, in San Diego right now, biotech is booming. And so people, a lot of people are getting, you know, jobs, um, which is great, you know, um, but we, I do need to refill the pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love that. And if I can add to that, we also do have on Dr. GPCR a career page. Uh, there is okay. a form. So it's drgpcr.com slash career. Uh, anyone and everyone is welcome to submit a job opening and we'll be happy to, uh, to advertise it and put it on our website. Uh, I think it's important to have that job board whether yeah. it's for academic positions or industry positions, and especially I think for industry positions, one of the issues is that if, if you're trained on GPCRs and you don't want to be a professor for any X, Y, Z reason, and you want to keep on working on GPCRs, it's very difficult to look at a job ad and say, oh, this is at company X and they might be working on GPCRs. So that's one yeah. of the reasons we created the, the career page. Yeah, which is one of the most visited pages on our website. So everyone oh, is wow. welcome to. Okay, post, well, I'll post, post one then because we actually do have an opening. So yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. And Great, post it. please, okay. please submit it. Well, okay. uh, thank you so much, Joanne, for your time. I really enjoyed our discussion. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. It was really great. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Okay. Thank you for joining us and listening to this Doctor GPCR podcast episode. We thank our guest our Dr. GPCR team members, Attila, Ines, Monserrat, Ivana, Andreina, Balint. Please subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter, find us on YouTube, and if you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also leave us a testimonial at drgpcr.com slash testimonials. Join us and sign up for the Dr. GPCR University course starting February 8th with Dr. Terry Kanakin. The deadline for registration is February 1st, 2024. When you register to the course, you will get a one-year complimentary access to the Dr. GPCR premium uh, membership. I hope you can join us. Another great way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. Email us with any questions or suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe.